with Dr. Ann Clayson. Ann Clayson, as you all know, is a leader of the New York Society for Ethical Culture. She holds a Doctor of Ministry degree in pastoral counseling from Hebrew Union College, as well as master's degrees in German from the State University of New York at Albany and business administration from New York University. Dr. Clayson is the Ethical Humanist Religious Life Advisor at Columbia University and Humanist Chaplain at NYU. She also participates in several interfaith social justice coalitions. Dr. Clayson. Good morning. I'm going to lower this a little bit <laughs> and turn on the light. Didn't this used to be on the other side? Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> Thanks. I need, there we go. You can see me now, right? Okay, terrific. All righty. Thank you for the neighborhood. That was lovely. <laughs> Did you all see the documentary about Mr. Rogers? Wasn't it lovely? Oh, gosh. Yeah, it's a reminder, isn't it? And, and that's what Jane Addams and John Lovejoy Elliott did, is they reminded folks that we're all human beings, that we're all neighbors. Um, and it really is very simple to be nice to one another, <laughs> to say good morning and how are you, and wait and listen to the response. <laughs> So I, I'm delighted to be sharing some stories about, about these two lovely people. So first of all, let me give you just some facts about them. Uh, Jane was the elder. Uh, Jane Adams was born on September 6th, 1860. John Lovejoy Elliott was born on December 2nd, 1868. Jane Adams grew up in wealth. Her family were very well off, um, and uh, she was in the Chicago area. John Lovejoy Elliott's family, not so much. They weren't rich, they weren't, weren't poor, they were, I guess what we would call solidly middle class, they were farmers. And so they grew what they needed on their farm and had enough to share with their neighbors. Jane Addams started Hull House in Chicago with her friend Ellen Gates Starr in September 1889, and that was in Chicago. John Lovejoy Elliott started Hudson Guild in Chelsea, which was then called the Wild West. Very different from what it is now, right? In 1895. The two of them met at summer school. <laughs> they met at the Ethical Culture Summer School, which Anna Garland Spencer started. And they met um, in Plymouth, uh, Massachusetts and had by that time a great deal to share. John was a lifelong bachelor. Um, although he had many admirers, and there were many stories told about him, um, but nobody knew for sure. Talk to Kirk Collier, he has some ideas. <laughs> he'll, he'll be later in, you know, later in the spring. Jane, on the other hand, had what was referred to at the time as a Boston marriage. And what that meant was that she had a partner for life. Um, and that partner was Mary Rosett Smith. And they were, for all intents and purposes, married. In fact, Hull House was kind of a hotbed for uh, other uh, life partners, female life partners. Um, and it was considered a place where the wealthy uh, could send their daughters. And I'm, I'm sort of jumping ahead of the story right now, but, I, but I'll come back to it. I just think it's a delicious tidbit um, about Hull House, right? Because Hull House uh, and Hudson Guild were part of the Settlement House movement. And the philosophy behind the Settlement House movement was very different from traditional religions. Um, I grew up Catholic, my husband grew up Jewish. In both of those traditions, there are very important charitable institutions. But they really um, 
their clients were Catholics and Jews, respectively, and sometimes they, you know, they, they did reach out to people from other traditions. Um, in the case of Jewish organizations, they didn't expect anyone to convert, but in the case of Catholic organizations, they did. <laughs> and so there was certainly that aspect of conversion. What was lovely about the settlement house movement as a philosophy was that it took the principles of ethical culture to heart. Now, I'm not saying not all settlement houses were ethical culture, but they certainly were all ethical. And you know the Henry Street settlement with Lillian Wald and, and, and other settlement houses. What they did was so different from that uh, religious philanthropy. What they said was, we want to live in the neighborhood. We want to be good neighbors. And we're not going to tell you what you want or what you need. Only you know that. We're going to listen to you. We're going to hear you. And then we're going to put everything that we can into that community. We're going to put our own resources, financial, intellectual, ethical, and we know a whole lot of other people who would like to do good things, and so we're going to let them do it here. <laughs> and in the case of young girls um, at that time, and, and when did I say that it was, she founded it? 1889. Okay, there weren't a whole lot of choices for women, certainly not women of the upper class. There were working women, we know working women, because they were on the farms, they were in the cotton mills, they were in the factories. We know right here the Triangle Shirtwaist Company and the fire that they had. There were plenty of women working there. But if you were upper, cl upper class and your parents were wealthy, you had to get married. <laughs> and you had to get married to someone your family chose. You could be a teacher, but you could only be a teacher until you got married. <laughs> Or you could be maybe a governess for someone else's family. If you were a spinster, you chose not to get married, maybe you would continue to be a teacher, maybe you would be the good aunt to your nieces and nephews. But Jane Addams was well known. And when she started Hull House, other parents said, ooh, we'll send our girls there. What they didn't know was that they became feminists. This was a feminist think tank. They reached out to the professors at the Chicago University. John Dewey loved Hull House, and he gave lectures there. The professors at the University of Chicago gave lectures at Hull House, and guess what? People really listened to them. They weren't just there for a degree. They weren't there to hobnob and make good connections. At Hull House, they were hungry to learn, and learn they did. One of the stories about, um, about uh, Jane Addams is that she decided to get politically active. But the way she did it was through the sanitation department, yes. Because when you live in a neighborhood, you know that if the garbage isn't picked up, if it's left there to fester, if things aren't clean, people will get sick and they will die too early. And so she took it upon herself in her district in Chicago to become the head of the sanitation department. John Lovejoy Elliott, for his part, was very involved in criminal justice. In fact, when he was at Cornell University, um, he grew up in the Midwest, and so um, they, they had uh, a history there. His family was part of the abolitionist movement in the Midwest, and they sent him east to go to, go to Cornell, and so he met Elliot, uh, I'm sorry, Elliot met Adler, <laughs> and he met him at, uh, when did he meet him? In 1889, so just about the time when Jane Addams was setting up Hull House in Chicago, John Lovejoy Elliott was meeting Felix Adler at Cornell. Adler didn't stay at, at Cornell too long. Um, he went there after giving the 
first and last sermon at Temple Emmanuel. Um, he had a chair at Cornell, um, and Cornell, the Board of Trustees decided that he was too radical to stay at Cornell, so he left there just as he left Temple Emmanuel because he was too radical for them. Not too radical for us. So that's why he founded Ethical Culture in 1876. But he went back to visit. And one of the reasons he went back to Cornell to visit was to recruit new leaders. And he saw in John Lovejoy Elliott someone who would be an excellent leader. And he was right. One of the things that Elliott was particularly drawn to was criminal justice because not too far from Ithaca is Elmira, New York, in the southern tier and there was a prison there. And so he was really drawn to prison reform because the prison in Elmira was not a good one. Well, none of them were at that time. And so with Adler's encouragement to become an ethical culture leader, John Lovejoy Elliott traveled to Germany because at that time, Adler still believed that the universities here weren't quite as good as the ones in Germany. So that first generation of leaders got set back there. So Elliot went, he got his doctorate there in prison reform. And he came back and he had a lot to do with it here in New York because when he started Hudson Guild, there was a gang. <laughs> and that gang in Chelsea was called the Hurly Burly Boys. And the Hurly Burly Boys were a rough bunch. And it's interesting. What he did is similar to what a lot of teachers do today, and certainly something that the faculty and administrators at my children's elementary school did years ago. They had a program at my children's school where they would train students to be peer counselors in the playground. And first they had to identify who those students would be. And so they allowed the children, their fellow students, to do some voting, but the faculty did as well, and it was weighted. And the ones who were chosen to be the peer counselors in the playground were those who had been identified as having leadership skills, but sometimes in antisocial ways. <laughs> they were the bullies. And so they were able to use their leadership skills in the playground. I remember my son being upset that he wasn't chosen. Meanwhile, I knew, that's right, because you're not a bully. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot did something similar with the Hurly Burly Boys. He identified who were the leaders there. And so what he did was he rented an apartment for them in Chelsea, where they could get together, where they could meet, where they could play ball. What's the first thing they did? They threw things out the window. Defenestration, that's what they did. And years later, when he bought a farm upstate, Hudson Guild Farm, which is a last been sold, sold to developers, um, when he bought that farm and brought his mother and his brother from the Midwest to farm that farm, what was the first thing they did when they got to the farm? They threw furniture out the windows. It seemed to be a rite of passage for the Hurly Burly Boys that he could never understand. But once he understood that they were going to do it, he just made sure he replaced the windows and went on from there. Since Jane Addams comes a little earlier, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to bounce back and forth a little bit and find you know, some connection. Um, so they're really you're getting two platforms in one here. <laughs> but I think it's important because our theme for this month is urban life. And you know, so much has been talked about now about how we living in cities uh, perforce, we must get along with each other. We take public transportation. We're on the buses, we're on the subways. And yes, according to an article in the business section of the New York Times last Sunday, most of us are looking at our devices and not looking up at each other. Still, we share these same spaces together. And many is the time when we will connect with other people, especially when there's an adorable child or an older people person who needs help, right? We all connect, we help that person in and out of the subway, in and out of the bus. So we have something going for us living in an urban area. And so that's kind of what both Jane Addams and John Lovejoy Elliott um, had going for them, that people already were connecting with one another, but what they didn't have was power, right? 
so they could help to empower their neighbors in those communities. So as I mentioned, one of the things that, uh, that uh, Jane Addams did was to bring folks together into Hull House. The first thing that she did, and, and, and you notice, you see sort of a pattern here. So Elliot rents an apartment and has the boys come in and they can have their games there. She, because she's got more money, buys a house. And in that house, she decorates it. She brings in beautiful works of art. She furnishes it with upholstered furniture. And people come in through the door and they don't know what to make of it because they're living in tenements. They're living several families in one apartment. And they walk into this house and they're afraid to touch anything. They don't know what to say. Many of them don't speak English. And she welcomes them. This is your home. This is your home. You can sit wherever you want. And then she invites, as I said before, other people in to offer them classes. So they're not only learning, they're also forming a sewing circle. They're learning to improve their language skills. They're helping one another. And they're bringing their children and they're reading children's stories to them. So here's a story. Um, <laughs> she loved to tell, Jane Addams and others would read stories, and so she tells the, the story about Roland, the young heroes, and so, and Shahrazad, and these kids just, they come around, and you'd say, any evening after four o'clock, you may see boys running to Hull House, disdaining the joys of craps, to hear tales of King Arthur and Prince Roland. One evening, never to be forgotten by one small boy, the Charlemagne stories came to an end after a whole long winter of them. He ran out of the door, rubbing the tears away from his rough little, with his rough little fist and crying, there's no good in coming anymore. Prince Roland is dead. <laughs> It, it, I, can't, I can't imagine. Can you just imagine for a moment what that must have been like, right? It was a very mean existence, right? You get up before the sun, right? If you're lucky, you had some breakfast, maybe some oatmeal, stale bread. You'd go off to your job, right? You'd go to your job in the factories and the mills, and then you'd come home probably after the sunset. What joy was there? you could walk through the doors of Hull House and see beauty, see beauty, right? The philosopher Nietzsche says, I'll paraphrase, that there is beauty in this world to preserve us from the hardship of reality, right? And their reality was hard, but not in Hull House, not in Hull House. So the same is true for Hudson Guild. And what happened in Hudson Guild was that he started off with that apartment, and then he rented more and more. And he started a couple of enterprises. He started um, a printing press because he thought it would be really good for these boys. Um, there was a big, there were a lot of newspapers in New York at that time. And he thought that it would be really good for the boys if they became printing apprentices. So he started a printing business for them. And many of them did indeed go into the printing business. Then, once he had the boys settled, he reached out to the parents. And so now you've got all these different clubs. The kids have clubs, the parents have clubs. They have sewing circles, and now they're talking to each other and they're doing some work around starting unions. So now they're getting involved here in New York City, forming different unions as well. It must have been a very exciting, exciting time. Now, Adam spent all of her time at Hull House. Jane, uh, yeah, John Elliot was bouncing back and forth between Chelsea and here. And you know that upstairs, 507 is the Elliot Library. We have a, uh, we have a portrait of him with his pipe. 
he always had his pipe. And the story goes that sometimes he would stick the pipe into his pocket and it would still be. <laughs> and one day he often had breakfast with the uh, president of the, of the, of the board, of, of the board, which at that time was both the society and the school. And sometimes the president would drop his children off at school and then he and Elliot would go out to breakfast. And so one day he called to Elliot's attention that his pocket was on fire. And he just pats it down and says, yes, well, I'm always on fire with one idea or another. <laughs> so a man of great good humor, great good humor. What Elliot was able to do by going back and forth was to sort of let the folks up here know about the folks down there. But there wasn't much crossover. You know, not too many folks from Chelsea came up here, and not too many people went down there, except to volunteer. I mean, and they did do a great deal of volunteer work, as some of our members had done um, at, at Hudson Guild. And, but there wasn't all that much crossover. And that's something for us to think about. Next month, we will have, as a guest speaker, I will be interviewing him, Ken Jockers from Hudson Guild. He would have been here this month for our theme of urban life, but had something else going on. So you get the good fortune of, of have, hearing about Hudson Guild next month as well. So it's, it's, I'm trying to put myself in that, in that mind uh, of what it was like to be there at that time and to be doing such a radical thing that was also such a simple thing in some ways. And that is, you know, reaching out and, um, and you know, and, and holding somebody and, and saying, I want to be part of your life. Um, will you let me be part of your life? Well, Hull House became quite famous. And so El uh, Adams was traveling around a lot um, and talking about and hoping, hoping that other cities would also um, have settlement houses and, and make a movement of it. She had the humility to know that she didn't know everything. And so whenever she was invited to another city to talk about Hull House, she always asked at least one other person, and, and more if they were available, because often they weren't available, uh, to come with her. Because she knew that she started it but they were the ones that were benefiting from it. And so she would always make sure that somebody, a woman, usually a woman from Hull House, would come with her, one of her neighbors, to talk about their own experiences. It reminds me of a couple of years ago at the Oscars, remember? During hashtag Me Too and hashtag Time's Up, when the celebrity actresses invited women to come with them and made sure that their stories were prominent, that their stories were told. And that's the kind of thing that Jane Addams did when she traveled around teaching people about Hull House. As I mentioned, they had other interests as well. Um, in addition to Hull House, Jane Addams co-founded with Anna Garland Spencer, another ethical culture lecturer here at the New York Society, um, and I, I just want to say a little note, because it is Women's History Month, that they were both, Anna Garland Spencer and Jane Addams were dynamic women. Very well known while they were alive. Um, Jane Addams is still well, no, well known today, Anna Garland Spencer not so much. But they were not full ethical culture leaders. They were lecturers. And Anna Garland Spencer, although she was a full Unitarian minister, and uh, she started the School of Philanthropy at Columbia, started the whole field of social work, and did the summer school for ethics in Plymouth, was not considered a full leader. That didn't come until Barbara Raines in the 1980s. And I'm the first one you've got here. <laughs> Just a little side note about, uh, about gender here. So she, Jane Addams and Anna Garland Spencer and others met in The Hague and they were opposed to World War I. And they were some of the folks who you know, went to DC, went to the White House and tried to talk to Wilson and tried to keep us from getting into the war. And what they ended up doing 
in The Hague was forming an organization that is still active today, but alas, I'm looking at Carol, very much like League of Women Voters, has older women in it and looking for a younger generation, and that's the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. This was indeed international. Women from around the world got together and said, our most important thing that we can do as women together is to stop war forever. In fact, that was how Jane Addams won the Nobel Prize for Peace, was because of her work in the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Eliot, for his part, had a great deal, as I mentioned before, to do with not only here at the New York Society, uh, but also with criminal justice. And he would often go to Osning, and he would go to Sing Sing to visit. He had a personal interest because many of the boys from Chelsea, when they grew up to become men and couldn't find employment, became criminals. And they ended up in Sing Sing. And so the story goes that one day he's traveling, he, he, he's in Sing Sing, and he's, he's walking around with folks, and the warden is with him. And folks are calling out, hey, Doc. They all call him Doc, Dr. Elliot. How are you doing? How are you doing? And the warden afterwards just shook his head, and he said, damn, more people know him than they know me. <laughs> but it's understandable in a way, because the warden was the administrator, and Elliot knew them well. He wrote to them. When he knew somebody was going up to visit, he would send cigarettes up with them. He kept that connection throughout his whole life. In fact, when he died, he had very little money. He lived in an apartment you know, in Chelsea, and uh, he didn't have much to leave. But what he left he left to pay for the legal fees for one of the young men in Sing Sing who was appealing his conviction. And that's what, uh, that was, was what was most important to him. So where do we go from here talking about them? There are so many wonderful stories about both of them. Um, how many of you maybe haven't realized that Elliot took over the New York Society when Adler died in 1933. He was not Adler's first choice. In fact, there was another young man whom he had groomed for this position, but there was a flu that was going around, and that young man caught the flu and he died, and Adler kind of lost heart. And he really put all of his, most of his time and energy into the school. Um, the Ethical Culture Fields in School. That was, he even, the, the society was certainly Adler's legacy, but the school even to a greater extent, and he put all of his energy there. So folks were kind of reeling after his death, and he, it was understood that Eliot would come in. But Eliot didn't really want to take over the leadership here at the New York Society, because his home was in Chelsea at Hudson Guild. So it was a difficult time. It was a very difficult time for him, and, and it must have been for the society as well. Um, because at that time, although the numbers were much greater than they are now, and there was what, a, a, a whole team of leaders, in fact, they were called the fraternity of leaders, there were a great number of them, um, forming both the ethics department at the school and also the many projects going on here, um, it was mostly an administrative job for him here. And he would have much preferred to have, um, you know, to have stayed at, at Hudson Guild. One of the things that he did is during uh, World War II. So we had two societies in Europe. Actually, we had three societies in Europe. Um, one of them is still there in London, which is somewhat connected. Um, it's called the Ethical Society. It's at Conway Hall in London. But there were two others, one in Vienna and one in Berlin. And uh, they were, as you can imagine, once the Nazis took over, in dire straits. And so the societies here were trying to bring them here and to save them. But a couple of them had been captured by the Nazis. So there's something in 1938 
Doctors Wilhelm Berner and Walter Exen, who were the leaders of the Vienna Ethical Society, wrote to the New York Society, it is a maddening experience, they wrote, to witness the nervous tension and strain that is prevailing, 1938. What is difficult to understand is that there is no law, yet perfect order. We are accustomed to associate law and order. When we find order, we think there must be law. But in Austria and Germany, <clears throat> there is neither law nor right. And they sent that in June 1938. So what the New York Society decided to do, and it was very cloak and dagger, they could not let a lot of people know about this because it was dangerous. But what they did was they arranged for Elliot to get their release, not only their release, but also the leaders of the Berlin Society. He had to pay for it. And so the members here got together a lot of cash, and he must have had it. I'm, I'm just picturing it. He must have had it all over, but it had to be cash. It's not like it can take a check, even a cashier's check at that time. Right? So he went there, they arranged for him, and this was a combination of ethical involvement with international affairs and courageous adventure. He was fully aware of the danger of his mission, and he probably relished it as an adventure, as well as an opportunity to engage actively in the struggle against Hitler and the Nazis. And this is kind of a bizarre thing. He didn't talk about it a lot. I wish he had. Wouldn't it make a great novel? Wouldn't it make a great movie? <laughs> but he really didn't talk about it a lot. But he had this strange reaction. He, he's meeting with one of the bigwigs, you know, to pay him off to arrange for this release. And he's telling, he says, well, what is ethical culture all about? And so Elliot's telling them all about ethical culture. It's about the common ground of ethics, putting deed above creed. He's really laying it on. And this bigwig says, oh, these are exactly the principles of the Fuhrer. <laughs> you imagine? How did the man, I, I admire Elliot for a lot of things. Keeping a straight face and following through had to be one of his greatest achievements, right? But he did it, he did it. In 1939, the New York Society formed with Elliot the Good Neighbor Association whose purpose was to promote tolerance and strengthen democracy. And once again, Eleanor Roosevelt came to us. She was the honorary chair who helped to meet the needs of the refugees. So that came out of that direct plea for help in 1938, and Elliot going to help. So we've got Jane Addams trying to get peace around the world and Eliot dancing off to Europe to bring back people who had been imprisoned and also to start the Good Neighbor Association for Refugees. There's a lot for us to take in and to connect to them today, right? We are part of the New Sanctuary Coalition, working together with other people here on the Upper West Side and throughout the city to, to offer sanctuary to refugees. We also have a homeless shelter and are part of the Interfaith Assembly on homelessness and affordable housing. We continue. I'm a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Um, I hope you, men may join also, as they, they also join the National Organization for Women, not of Women. So it's still around, please Google them, and please become a member. My neighbor up the street in Brooklyn, her grandmother was with Jane Addams and Anna Garland Spencer in forming the Women's International League. So there are still these wonderful stories, hey Fabio? Wonderful stories to be told, and wonderful connections of our history that we bring forward, that we bring forward into the present. And Liz and I go to the John Lovejoy Elliott dinners at Hudson Guild, just to remind them that we're still here 
that we still support them, and we should. We'll see Elliot, we'll see um, uh, Ken Jockers next month. I'd like to conclude with um, a couple of things. One is a poem that was written about Jane Addams at The Hague. And it was written by Vachel Lindsay to Jane Addams at The Hague. Lady of light and our best woman and queen, stand now for peace, though anger breaks your heart, though naught but smoke and flame and drowning is seen. Lady of light, speak though you speak alone, though your voice may seem as a dove's in this howling flood, it is heard tonight to every senate and throne. Though the widening battle of millions and millions of men threatens tonight to sweep the whole of the earth, back of the smoke is the promise of kindness again. And I'll let Elliot give us the last words. And this goes back to actually when I interned here. I interned in 2001. The first day was September 11th. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, I was working on my degree in pastoral care and counseling. Boy, did that come in handy. <laughs> While I was here, the receptionist took a call from someone. And he was very angry. This young man was very angry. He said, the, the receptionist told me, he just says he needs to talk to someone. And since you're the intern, you're it. It's like playing tag. You're the intern, you're it. Okay. So I talked to this guy, and he was indeed very angry. He decided that, excuse the expression, I'm only quoting him, God is bullshit. Some of you may agree. Anyway, so he apparently had been proclaiming that um, at a number of houses of worship along the Upper West Side, and they were not liking it too much. <laughs> So he ended up here. <laughs> so I asked him, what do you know for sure? You don't know whether you believe in God right now. You think God is bullshit. OK. What do you believe in for sure? And he said that I'm a good person. I said, OK. Let's start with that. Stick with what you know, and don't get stuck on what you don't know. So he says, wait a minute, I can do that? I said, of course you can. Believe in yourself. Maybe you just need to take a little break from God. If she does exist, she'll understand and still be there when you're ready. In the meantime, stick with what you know about yourself. Believe in your heart that you are a good person and act accordingly. Can I really do that? He said, of course you can. So then he asked what I believe. He said, well, I like what ethical culture leader John Lovejoy Elliott said. I have known good people who believed in God. I have known good people who didn't believe in God. But I have never known good people who didn't believe in people. So he and I chatted a little bit longer about that, and I felt like I had given him back to himself in a way. He kind of was lost. I mean, literally, knocking on doors of churches. <laughs> we all need to reclaim ourselves, right? I thought, just give ourselves permission to be good because that's what human beings are by nature. Well, at the end of the phone call, I asked him how he found us. And he said, oh, I looked up in the phone book under ethical. <laughs> so P 
people are going to continue to look up in the phone book under ethical, and they're going to find us. And maybe they're going to believe something, and maybe they aren't. And we're going to tell them to look downstairs where it says, deed above creed. That you've been raised in one particular way, you've been taught certain things. Hold on to the things you've learned that are good, that you can use in practical things in your life, and let go of the rest. And walk through the door and be part of a community that puts ethics at the center of our lives back in 1876, today, and forever. Um, and I know that we are, I, I, I said a word about encampment? Okay. Okay, the shared charity uh, is encampment for citizenship. Um, so, Fabio, come on up. So, first of all, it's Fabio's birthday. <laughs> so, I know we can sing because I heard you before. So, <laughs> come here, my dear. Ready? Right. Okay. Happy birthday. for two summers. So I'm on the board, but who better to talk about the encampment than someone who's been there? Yeah. And I know that you can talk on the spur of the moment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, it's funny, like every birthday I really reflect, you know, my life and what I've been to. And I think, uh, you know, I'm, I've been actually thinking about the relationship I have in my life and how come I have those relationships. And I think that one of the most beautiful things with the ethical relationship that I have, it was one of the place that a dark part of where I was, you know, looking for a place to cope. And in a weird way, I find people that are very different from me, you know, very different age, different background, and able to let me cope. And that relationship led to the encampment, that relationship led to doing community organizing in my neighborhood. And that, you, you actually were speaking about like a neighborhood housing. And actually that's what I'm doing. It, it was a very interconnected things. And I think a lot of time in life, we have to understand the relationship we have in life. And I think to all of you, you know, I don't know how to say thank you enough to that wonderful relationship that I have to actually see what can I do ethically in the real world. Because the real world is actually where we should practice ethics and value. And I think that's what the encampment do for young people. Because young people are looking for a place to be themselves and to be in a place that they can actually make choice and make decisions, say, what is, what is society should look like? And what society should act and should design? and they design it themselves. They run the camp, they operate the camp, and they actually challenge each other. You're Jewish, you're Native American, you, you cross the border, you, know, you live with that person. That relationship will be the relationship that make you the person you are for the rest of your life. So I want to really thank the Ethical Society and every one of you that, you know, you know, every Sunday when I used to come, you guys make my Sunday, you know, this Sunday, Every time I see people talking about the theater, the politics, you know, seeing Jose, seeing the kids, seeing Audrey, seeing Anne, and I really grew up here. So, you know, for the bottom of my heart, really thank you. Wow. And I didn't warn him ahead of time. He's eloquent. Thank you so much. <laughs>